Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all very much for joining us on this Friday evening during the lockdown. This is our first webinar, uh, and it's entitled Fertility Checkups, All You Need to Know About the New Normal. So first, I would like to introduce our speakers for this evening. I will be covering a little bit of the talk, and then Dr. Gita Venkat will be covering the clinical aspects of the fertility checkups, and then Molly Granik, our counsellor, will be going through the psychological and emotional aspects of it, and then Karina Nebrega, who's one of our patient coordinators, will go through the practical steps that you may wish to consider. And so that brings us to the agenda. First, I'd like to give you a bit of history on what's happened during the lockdown to fertility treatments in the UK, because some of you who sort of haven't been through treatment may just be curious as to what's occurred. And then I'd like to discuss just very briefly the steps that we're taking to make the clinic as COVID-free and as risk-free to all our patients and staff as possible, because we don't want anyone to fall ill during having a checkup. Um, that would sort of defeat the purpose. And then we'll get on to the meat of it, which is to discuss the actual changes that we've made to the checkup in view of COVID-19 and the lockdown. And then we'll go on to the emotional and psychological aspects. And then lastly, but not least, the practical aspects. So the impact of novel coronavirus or COVID-19 on fertility treatments. Um, so one big difference is that a lot of us have now started working from home after the lockdown, as you can probably see from my background, which is not my usual office. The UK has a very unique and independent regulator of all fertility clinics. They are known as the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, and they regulate and license all fertility clinics within the UK. And at the end of March, they issued a very unusual and special um, instruction to all clinics, which is to say that no new treatments should be started with immediate effect. I think this is the first time such a, such a process ever, has ever occurred in the history of fertility treatments in the UK. So centres were told to wind down their activities safely. They should complete all their current treatments. They were allowed to offer sort of ongoing monitoring to patients who are pregnant and also provide treatments to patients ahead of non-elective fertility preservation. So this is patients who might be undergoing chemotherapy, um, but we were not allowed to start any other treatments at all. So this, like I said, this was very unique historically. We've never found ourselves in a situation where we've had to sort of close the clinic because we were told to. Um, and so first we all said, what on earth is going to happen? And everyone was really worried. We didn't know what was going to happen. But, you know, we all then just sat around and discussed what we should do, the steps we should take. And we wound down our clinic. You know, the priority was to take care of our current patients and make sure that they completed their treatments safely and effectively. And we wound down our activities and then planned what services we needed to keep open because those were critical to maintaining the health and well-being of patients who were currently pregnant. And then we got to thinking, okay, what's next? And, you know, the issue is while the lockdown sort of stops all our activity, the biological clock really doesn't wait because of this pandemic. So we started to ask ourselves, how can we continue to support our patients even though we're closed? So we switched to a more remote way of working. Uh, we started to do consultations remotely and offer counselling remotely. And then we also procured some home test kits, which allowed us to do bits of our work remotely. And so we could continue to provide you know, valuable clinical advice, even though we were closed on site. And, you know, so we took all these efforts and you can see all these sort of posts on our blog about what we did to try and help our patients and try and reassure them. We've had a lot of questions from patients about their frozen samples at the clinic. Are they all safe and all of this? So, we, you know, we tried to continue to maintain contact with our patients because we feel that's really important.
then you know we we got used to this way of working and as things progressed we you know continued and then in the 1st of may the hfea wrote to us again and said that clinics will you know be able to apply to resume treatment from the 11th of may and we've just passed that date and but in order to do so clinics must develop a new covid-19 strategy to minimize the risk of any infection because obviously, if we do reopen, um, you know, the coronavirus threat hasn't really disappeared. And we want to make sure that anyone who comes to the clinic has minimum chance of um, acquiring this illness. And so we've developed a new strategy, which I'll talk through in just a second. And we sent in our application earlier this week. And I can I have the pleasure of saying that we have now received permission to restart licensed treatments on site and we will start to do that from next week. This is a summary of all the changes that we've made in order to try and reduce the risk of any infection being transmitted on site. Um, because the last thing we want to do is have infection at the clinic, because then that would mean we would have to potentially close down or you know, decontaminate the whole clinic, which is a mammoth task, really. So we've tried to switch all appointments to telemedicine or remote means such as you know video consultations where possible. So where we don't actually need to touch the patient, we offer remote appointments now. We've made mandatory sort of personal protective equipment, PPE requirements for staff and for patients, be it gloves and face masks and various other things. We have put in place social distancing measures based on the government advice and we're limiting the number of patients on site at any time and we're limiting the number of people in each room. We're also making sure that we go through quite a thorough screening questionnaire with all people before they attend the clinic. So when we book patients for appointments at the clinic, we make sure that they don't currently have, appear to have the infection. And we then temperature check every patient before they actually, you know, come, well, when they come in. And if anyone, you know, has any indication that they might be ill, we would not, we would advise them to not come into the clinic. So that way we try and keep the clinic as COVID free as possible. And then on the sort of clinical side, we've increased our appointment times to try and space our appointments out a bit more. We've increased the decontamination procedures that we use. And for patients who, are going to go through treatment, we are making sure that they are screened negative for SARS-CoV-2, which is um, COVID-19. And we're also reducing the number of visits they physically have to make to the clinic in order to, again, minimize their risk. And last, which is not probably very favorable with patients, we're asking, unfortunately, that no partners or visitors attend because, again, we're just trying to limit the number of people on site. Um, but these days, you know, technology is our friend and you can always, you know, make use of video calling to have your loved one or friend there with you um, during your appointment. So now I would like to hand over to um, Dr. Kita Venkat, who will walk you through the fertility checkup and what has changed. Thank you. Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much for joining us on this webinar, especially being a weekend evening, Friday evening. It's very precious and uh, we will make it useful for you. And uh, please feel free to ask questions at the end of this. First of all, before starting treatment in any clinic, you would like to go for exploring the clinic. You will do that research on the internet and choose your clinic and first step would be to have a consultation with one of the consultants in the clinic they will take a detailed medical history to know what has happened so far and to see if there are any indications or clues to find out the cause of your fertility as to why things are not happening therefore so this is the medical history questionnaire we will go through with the patient and it's usually done in the clinic in front of the patient that is patients or couples used to come to the clinic and then we were doing the history as is shown here because this is my office and i used to do it with the lockdown so we had to do everything 
remotely. And also we wanted to make it easy for the patients and reduce the risk. So we did the consultation, but at the same time, not on telephone because you can't see the consultant. It's always good to see the face and see the body language and talk to them. Therefore, we do video consultation, which are virtual consultations on Skype or Zoom, whatever you prefer, and we send an invitation and we do that and go through the same medical history sheet and find out if you have had endometriosis or fibroid or any problem with your periods because these are all clues so that we know that this could be the issue in your case. Once you have taken the history, the next step is to do the tests to find these are called investigations to find out where the issue could be. I'm not saying will be, could be. And again, we have to say the tests are for females and the males because I know that in most of the clinics, the males are forgotten. We don't talk about them, but they are also partners here. They also have feelings and we have to respect them. So we say, come as couple. So when we do the consultation, we would like both the partners to be present for the Zoom or video kind of Skype consultation. So what is involved in the test is for the female, we do a blood test to check all the hormones. That is anti-mullerian hormone, FSH. Anti-mullerian hormone is the one which gives us information about the number of eggs or it is called ovarian reserve. That is the key hormone or important fact because all you are trying to find out is, do I have enough eggs for my age? Supposing people are coming late to the clinic in the sense when someone is 38, 39, they think that, oh, have I run out of my eggs? I need to know. So that important hormone we check is AMH. And the other three hormones, follicular stimulating hormone, FSH, luteinizing hormone, LH and estradiol, these three go together as a group and they give us information about the ovarian function. So this is the number of eggs, this is the function, what it means is what is the quality of the eggs, how your ovaries are doing their job. And the next one is prolactin and thyroid function. These two, again, are related to the ovarian function and interfere with your ovulation. So if the prolactin is high, or thyroid function is low and you are low in thyroid hormone, then there is a risk that your implantation will be affected with high prolactin and increased risk of miscarriage because of that high prolactin and low thyroid. So it's important. And similarly, you might be wondering why are we checking vitamin D? What has it got to do with uh, my egg number or ovulation? That's nothing to do with that, no. Yes, that is true. Your question is very logical because when I started my career, we were not checking vitamin D for the females because nobody knew the relationship between the vitamin D and ovarian function. Now they have found that it is also important and vitamin D deficiency is common, especially in the ethnic background like uh, Asian, Afro-Caribbeans because they need more sunshine. And if it is deficient, it can cause miscarriage because it affects the lining of the womb, make it thin and increase, causes increased risk of miscarriage. That's why now we are asking every woman to check their vitamin level and if it is low, it's easy to correct it. So it's a simple treatment and it's relevant now for the fertility checkup. So that's why we check all these hormones and if you go to some places, they check the hormones. If they are not fertility specialists, they do all these hormones, but they check at the wrong time. The basic thing is these hormones should be checked between the second and fifth day of the period, particularly the FSH, LH, and the estradiol. AMH can be done at any time. Prolactin, thyroid, and vitamin D can be any time. But the three hormones to know about the quality and the quality of the eggs and ovarian function, they have to be particularly done between second and the fifth day of your period. That is why we thought when we are doing one test, why don't we combine all the tests? So we say, do all the tests at the same time. And the information is not complete with the blood test. Therefore, 
we would like you to have an ultrasound scan. What we were doing before, during the lockdown, was we were sending a kit, home test kit, so you could test by finger prick and send the sample to the lab, and they were giving us information about the hormones, and we were assessing it because nobody could come to the clinic. But now that we are open, we would like the patients or the woman to come to the clinic and have an ultrasound scan because we can have a lot more information from looking at your uterus and ovaries. As you can see in this picture, that's the uterus. And we look at the uterus to see there is anything projecting into the cavity like polyp or fibroid. Sometimes fibroid may be outside also that can still reduce somebody's chances of getting pregnant. And we look at the ovaries to see, do they look normal in appearance? Do they look normal in size? And do they have good number of eggs? These are the three things. Or sometimes women can have cysts or other abnormalities in the ovaries. And we check all that. And some and the other factor is the fallopian tubes, which unfortunately you cannot see in the normal scan. It has to be seen with the introduction of a dye into the cervix. Then we can see the outline of the fallopian tube. So we don't check that in the first baseline scan. We check these two uterus and ovaries. These are the two main organs of reproduction. We do that. So this is as far as the female is concerned. Next, we come to the males. And as you know, for the males, everything is simple. Life is complicated for women, but men, it is very simple. But at the same time, some of them find it difficult to do a sample, particularly if you ask them to do it in the clinic and they feel that they are put on the hot spot and they get very stressed and to, to give a sample for assessment. And now, because of the lockdown, we have a device that is called testing the sperm at home, home sperm test kit. And we send it to my post to you. you want the, it contains some two sample parts. Male partner can do the sample at home in the comfort of his home because you don't, he, he's not doing it in the clinic, which is a big and huge relief to many patients because whenever I talk to them, and I tell them, we will send it to you and you do it at home. Oh, there's a big smile on their face. And what they need to do is collect the sample, put a few drops on a slide, which is provided in the kit and attach the slide to the device. Then you have to plug the device to the computer or you plug it to the iPhone, some of the phones. And then in five minutes time, the result will be displayed on the phone or on the computer. If you then email it to me, then we can discuss it. So what we usually do is the follow-up consultation to discuss the results of both sides. Okay, so what? You see the difference what we did before COVID-19 and lockdown, we did in-person consultation. So everybody came to the fertility clinic and uh, we had of waiting room full of patients at, at different stages, but now the waiting room is empty because we don't invite the patients to come to the clinic. So we do all the consultations remotely, either by telephone or Zoom or Skype. And then we arrange the test. That is the ultrasound scan and horror profile. We were doing it at home, I was telling you, but not the scan, only the hormone profile. But now people are working on it for remote scans where the woman can scan herself and the result will come to the doctor. That is the future of the ultrasound scan. Please wait a couple of years, it will come. But now, since the clinic is open, we are able to do the scan and the blood test and therefore we'll get the results soon. And for the male, before we were doing the on-site semen assessment, now we are doing the at home, that is, you can do send the sperm kit and they can do that. And then it will tell you whether the sperm count is normal or below normal. And then I will go through the number and explain the details to you. That will happen during the follow-up consultation, which is part of the same package. There's no extra charge. And before, again, we were asking the couples to come to the clinic to discuss the results. Now they don't make the journey. They sit at home 
and then we discuss in Zoom or Skype the results of the male as well as the female. So we have the whole picture that is on both sides. Then we discuss the options depending on the age, what has happened before, and whether you have a child before or not, and depending on the hormone profile, number of eggs and the sperm count and the motility of the sperm, all these things then we say, look, you can try naturally or we do some simple treatments like intrauterine insemination or you know, the situation, say you're coming to 40, the egg number is low, sperm count is low, the best option would be to consider IVF. So depending on the findings, then we'll tell you what are the options and what is the best option in your case. So we will go through that. I want to explain to you about the sperm kit. I told you how it works, but as you know, and I tell you, it's, unless you see it, it's difficult to follow it. So this is the home test kit and they haven't shown the pots they supply. So the male partner will produce the sample at home. And this is the slide. So they put a couple of, a few drops that the instructions are given in the package. And then the slide is attached to this device. This is the device. And you can attach the, plug the device to the phone or plug it to the computer. And then after five minutes or so, uh, the, the device will read the sperm count and then give you the result. And this, of course, is not a comprehensive sphere sperm analysis because in the detailed analysis, we check so many sperm parameters. So that will be a detailed analysis, but this is a simple and short analysis for initial diagnosis. This will guide us which treatment or which option is the right one for you. So that is enough for that. What it will say, so whereas on-site is a comprehensive one. And if this is not sufficient in someone's case, I will recommend that please come to the clinic. We will have to do a detailed analysis in your case. And this will tell us whether you have got enough motile sperm for trying naturally or simple treatments, or the sperm is not good enough Therefore, you need to go for IVF treatment or ICSI treatment. But this is good enough to start with, and we can proceed with treatment based on this result and the female test result. So that is what we do now, and uh, most of it is done at home. All the parts except the female test for which you have to make one journey. We always say, stay safe, and if you can come by your car, it's always better, but if you can't, then make some arrangements and maintain the social distancing, wear masks and gloves to protect yourself. And then we can do, once you are done the test, we arrange the follow-up consultation. This slide is the one which tells you how we interpret the test, which I will discuss in the follow-up consultation. So if you look at it, according to WHO criteria, we should have a minimum of 15 million sperm per ml. It is per ml, that's why it's called concentration. This is not the total sperm in the whole sample. It is per ml. Say if someone produces three ml, it should be at least 15 million per ml. That means 45 million minimum. So that's the cutoff and motility. That means it is the percentage of the sperm which are moving well. It should be at least 40% of this, so of the total sperm. So if you take this minimum cutoff, we say at least we should have 15 million sperm and 40% of them should be moving. So what is 40% of 15 million? It is 6 million. So that is we have 6 million per ml of motile sperm in the sample. That is the cutoff. So if you have at least 6 million motile sperm per ml, it is good enough for making a woman pregnant, or you can try naturally, go for all simple treatments such as intrauterine insemination or ovulation induction, anything. But if the count is lower than that, then it will say, it, the result will be displayed as moderate or normal, more than 6 million per ml or it will say low, in which case we say, unfortunately it is low, we need to go for IVF or ICSI treatment. 
And anyway, when you come for your treatment on the day, we'll perform a detailed analysis of your sperm and then decide whether IVF is enough or should we do more advanced form of IVF, which is ICSI. But the initial fertility checkup, this is very good. And I don't think any other clinic has this device. We are the only people, only clinic who have this home sperm test kit, which has come very handy. We developed it because I used to go to Dubai for some conferences. They wanted me to uh, talk about portable devices in fertility. And we sort of got this, made this available at that time. Now, during this lockdown, this came very handy and so many couples have benefited because they haven't lost their time. While waiting, they wanted to get investigated and they have benefited from this. So it will be useful for you. Okay, so I have to now hand over to my colleague, um, Molly Grinick, who is our counselor. Molly and myself have been working together for a long time and we know each other. We are very good friends. She will talk to you about the psychological issues and what has changed and what she's doing right now. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Really just um, a few words about um, the impact that um, COVID has had really on the psychological and emotional aspects of treatment, which seemingly has not changed that much apart from raising anxieties, mainly into the ticking clock. Are, has, has this the, the impact of the two, three months lockdown taken away some of the time factor that was already very precious for me? And am I going to have to wait much longer to have my treatment now? So in essence, what we're looking at here is trying to share some of the experiences that we have about um, samples, about gametes. You see the clinic has closed for two months. Who's been looking after all our precious gametes, our eggs, our sperm, and is everything in essence, is it safe? So counseling or therapy around the issues that may arise, the anxiety that we feel, is not magic. Freud, who invented therapy and therefore counseling, he suggests that the more stuff we internalize, the more it will manifest in what he calls the neurotic disorders, anxiety, panic disorder, depression. So having a safe forum through the counseling session helps to alleviate some of the anxieties that we feel. Throughout your journey, you probably have experienced a multitude of um, emotions, including anxiety, sadness, loss, anger, frustration, things like that. So one of the other things, of course, experiencing these um, uh, emotions, it's been very difficult to share it with people because we have been in isolation and we felt very much alone. So finding a way, albeit remotely, to share some of our experiences, to talk about our feelings is really important. Too many of us dismiss our feelings of sadness, loss, and we replace those feelings with um, concern that other people are much worse off than we are. And whereas that, that may well be true, it doesn't take away from the subjectivity of your own feelings. So it is important that you stay with those and that you take your feelings seriously and that you try to express some of the feelings and some of the anxieties that you feel with the counsellor of the clinic or with different counsellors that you can get through the British Infertility Council and Association or Free Network UK, you can find counsellors that will talk about these things uh, with you. So it is important to try and find a way to manage anxiety. Anxiety is a perfectly normal emotion. We all experience it and it can sometimes be very useful. It's a great leveler, it's a great motivator. It keeps us on our toes, it gets us to the next stage. Without anxiety, we may then consider that we 
remain ambivalent about things. So it makes us pick up the phone, it makes us say, hey, what's happening? Can you give me some information? It's when anxiety becomes completely overwhelming that we get into difficulties with it. It becomes what we call a disorder. So anxiety, when the body's stressed and when the body's anxious, it produces stress hormones, it produces cortisol from the cortex of the, bit of the brain, and it produces adrenaline from the adrenal glands above the kidneys. And the circulating stress hormones have a manifest and effect on our bodies. We start to experience um, our heart beats faster, we hyperventilate, we get a bit tense and a bit anxious again. And it is, in essence, it is the body getting ready to escape what it perceives to be danger. It's a fight or the flight. The circulating stress hormones, the cortisol, the uh, adrenaline, also has an effect on our cognitive function, thought process, in that we lose focus, we cannot um, concentrate on things, we forget things. And so therefore, when we are super anxious about fertility, it interferes with the way that we do our job. We cannot focus. And then we get into trouble and then our anxiety increases again. So managing anxiety is very important. And the counsellor will take you through some ways of um, keeping anxiety in check by some mindful meditation exercises by reducing the circulating stress hormones, which indeed reduce the feelings that we have, the feelings of anxiety. So anxiety, natural, normal, sometimes helpful. The fear that we have about our ticking clock, about um, the longer wait times, all of these things, fear again could be considered as, fear could be considered as, um, wisdom perhaps in the face of danger when we see something that we're fearful of we're very mindful not to confront it full on we take our time tentatively approach these things so again trying to manage emotion infertility treatment is important stress hormones again are very powerful hormones they can make us sick if we if they overwhelm us they can make us sick they can make us physically sick as well as emotionally sick so much so that sometimes when a, a transplant surgeon is transplanting an organ kidney heart lungs whatever we we sometimes give the recipient of the organ stress hormones because we know it lowers immunity and therefore their ability to reject the organ is less. So lowering immunity is not great when we're trying to keep in physical health, emotional health. So again, trying to manage anxiety and the symptoms that anxiety leaves us with is really important. So the things again, coming back to the ticking clock, the longer waiting time, where are our samples, who's looking after them, and can indeed have our fertility treatment performed safely and uh, expeditiously and who's going to take responsibility for coordinating all that and perhaps this is then the right time to hand you over to Karina who's going to talk about uh, patient coordination and um, again just before I leave the talking cure talking about your anxiety is so important especially in a time where so many of us have felt alone so approaching the clinic asking the nurses to explain things to give you some support and to organize an appointment to come and see me at the clinic so that we can offer you so that i can offer you some support and some techniques and strategies for managing all the things that we've spoken about thank you Hi everyone. So I know I've probably spoken to quite a few already. So my name is Karina, one of the patient coordinators. From a practical side, I guess what I want to 
let you know is that we understand that lockdown has been difficult and continues to be a difficult situation and um, we're all learning to adapt to a new normal so I'm here to hopefully help you in taking those first steps in your fertility journey and help ease that. As has been mentioned before, one of our top priorities is to ensure your safety. And one of the ways we can do that is to continue to have those remote consultations in order to minimise the number of patients in and out of the clinic at any one time. So we do have, so all consultations are available. We have different options such as Skype, telephone, or um, Zoom as well. So whatever you would prefer, we can arrange that for you. Um, we also understand that you have busy schedules, so we can um, accommodate evening consultations where possible. Just let us know and we can definitely accommodate you and help you where we can. And just on a final note, um, as we've mentioned, we are now being given the green light to recommend treatments. So please feel free to give us a call if you need any help or anything, if you have any questions. I'm here to help and support you. You know, if I don't have an answer for you, I will always find out and get back to you. That, you know, that's I can guarantee. And so give us a call or contact us by email and I'll be very happy to have a chat with you. And if you have any questions or just want to have a chat through different treatment options. Thank you. All right, thank you all very much. So I would like to now turn over to the Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, please use the, the Q&A functionality in the webinar panel or alternatively raise your hand and I think Gavin can, actually, sorry, can unmute you and let you ask your question orally. We have had one question through already. So the question is, does this process, I presume the, the process of a, a checkup, apply to a patient who attended the clinic five years ago? Do they need to do all of the female tests again? So if I could ask Dr. Venkat to please answer this question. Yes, uh, it's a good question. A lot of people ask this question. Yes, if it is done some time back, I think it's better to repeat it. But if it is done recently within one year, and all the tests have been normal. We don't usually repeat unless someone is uh, sort of over the age of 38 because after the age of 35, you know, our body changes a lot. The hormones change every year. The egg number keeps going down. I think we can't rely on old results because before we plan your treatment, I need to know or my colleagues need to know what is happening? What is the update, up-to-date information about your egg reserve, quality of the egg, sperm count? Then only we can provide you the best option and best outcome. Therefore, if it is relevant, especially if the past results have been abnormal, then we might ask you to repeat it. But if it is done in the reasonable or recently reasonable time, and if it's been normal, we won't waste your money or time. Thank you very much for that Inf informative answer. We've had another question which reads, it's from Ben, it says, how long is your lead time for booking checkups at the moment? So I can probably answer this one myself. I believe it's a couple of days um, for booking the initial consultation at the moment. So as I mentioned earlier, we are starting treatments um, from the week next week or the week after very shortly so the clinic will start to get busier and busier so you know now is quite a good time for arranging these appointments the next question we have is the treatment consistent with the same consultant so do we offer continuity of care again i'll hand over to dr venkat for this one if that's okay Yes, okay, this is a very good question because this is one of our, the ethos of our clinic and uh, I know it doesn't happen in big corporate clinics and I have worked in reputable and uh, high, high profile clinics. They all do a great job, produce babies, high success rate, but in many of those clinics, the one thing which is lacking is the continuity of care because you feel lost in an ocean, in an ocean because there are different people, uh, doing different things for you and you feel uncomfortable talking to the new face. Therefore, we believe that continuity of care is important, particularly in fertility treatment because it's an emotional treatment. It's not only clinical, there is a lot of emotional attachments here and we want 
patients to feel comfortable and less stressed during the treatment. That's why we offer the same consultant who will be managed, you will see you, and then who will manage your treatment and do the procedures for LIK collection and embryo transfer. But the scans and blood tests and other things will be done by nurses and ultrasonographers, our assistants, but we will be supervising your case and whenever it is time for the collection and procedures, it will be done by your consultant. So you have your familiar taste and if you have questions during the treatment, you can always or we can arrange telephone consultations or you can email and then the consultant will answer your queries. Thank you very much. The next question that we have is, it's great that a man can do sperm tests at home, but what if sperm quarantine is required? Wouldn't it be better to come to the clinic and do sperm tests and take sperm sample for quarantine in the same time? Shall I take that question? Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. Awesome. Right. Yes, this is a good and practical question. If somebody wants to freeze the sperm and keep it in quarantine, basically before we put the sperm in quarantine, we have to test the gentleman to see whether he has got any infections such as the hepatitis B, HIV, hepatitis C, because if some man, gentleman has got infection, then his sample has to go in the tank, which has got other people's sample with infection. Whereas people who are clear of infection, they will have a separate tank. Therefore, before freezing and putting the sample in quarantine, we usually do the blood test called screening test. Therefore, when we do the semen analysis or when we do the quarantine, we don't do the semen analysis at the same time. That's what I wanted to tell you. Therefore, first step is only analysis or assessment. We are not planning to freeze the sample or quarantine the sample. If someone is interested in that, obviously, we'll ask them to have a consultation first and then do all the necessary screening tests. Then we will do the, we'll ask the gentleman to provide the sample in the clinic and we will assess the sample and freeze the sample once we know the results of the screening test. Yes, at that time, definitely the sample will be tested in the clinic and uh, acted accordingly. The next question I have is, so for a full fertility check for male and female, how many face-to-face -face appointments would be required? It's a very good question and the answer is just one is what we've managed to reduce it down to. So the initial consultation would be done remotely. The female tests would be done in a single visit. So the ultrasound scan and the full hormone profile would be done in one visit at the right time in her cycle. And the male test is done at home. And then the follow-up is done remotely. So it'd be a single visit to the clinic. And then another question is, for embryo transfer, is the room kept warm for the lady and the embryo being transferred? Yes, uh, so this is one of the HFEA guidelines, you know, in the lab, the temperature has to be maintained. So there are two types of uh, temperatures we have to maintain. One is where we are working with the gametes and the embryos that is under the hood, we call it, and the uh, temperature of the equipments where we work with. And the other one is the room temperature. So similarly, here when we work in the theater where we put the embryos back in, the room temperature has to be maintained at certain degrees and uh, we keep it. There is also a check on that. There is what is called the probe, which will be measuring the temperature of the room 24 hours a day. And if the temperature drops below certain level, it will alarm. This alarm is connected to so many of the staff here. That is all the manager, myself, and the lab people, lab embryologists. So one of them will check it if they are in the clinic. Or Suvir knows it very well. He has run to the clinic so many times in the middle of the night when the alarm goes off. And we check and make sure the temperature of the room, temperature of the incubator, temperature of the freezer, and all the tanks where the embryos are frozen are maintained. So to answer your question, yes, it is all maintained. And when we transfer the embryos, we don't take the embryo out and leave it for half an hour and I talk to you, explain to you, no, it doesn't happen. We do all the talking. In fact, we even insert the catheter inside your womb. 
Only then the embryologist will take the embryo out from the uh, incubator and then load it onto a catheter and give it to me. So the embryo transfer is actually performed under 30 seconds. Therefore, there is minimum disturbance to the embryo regarding the temperature fluctuation. The lab has to be maintained. That leads to the success rate. So I think I just I think just to also say yes we do keep the room it's not like some clinical rooms that are very cold for examination rooms it's it the, our theatre is kept at a nice warm temperature so that you're comfortable during your embryo transfer. So usually the probe maintains it around 30 31 degrees so it will be sort of warm warmer than the other rooms. Okay, the next question I have is, is it advisable for a single woman over 36 to do a fertility MOT, even though she is not ready to try for a baby yet? However, there are some concerns about hormonal changes and history of fibroids. I will stop with, and then also there's more to the question, which says, how reliable is the fertility MOT? Some specialists have advised against this unless the woman is struggling to get pregnant. Well, there, yeah, there are always different views. Different consultants have different views. It depends on who you ask. If you ask the fertility specialist, the answer will be different. Whereas if you ask a gynecologist, it will be a different answer. You ask your partner or you ask your friend, it will be a different answer. But if you ask the fertility specialist, the answer is yes. And even though that, you know, you're not trying for a baby at this age, your age is critical here. So you crossed the 35 years. And as you know, the egg number keeps going down as well as the egg quality goes down, the deteriorate. So actually the peak of fertility is between late 20s and early 30s. Therefore, if you're passing that, it's better to do the fertility checkup. Now, the question is that why some people say it's not useful is because if you are not going to have a baby now, and if you know that there is an issue, you will start becoming anxious, like Molly pointed out, and it will lead to unnecessary worry on your side. But because previously there was nothing you could do about it, unless you change the plan in your life and go for a baby at that stage, you couldn't do anything. However, now we have other options open for you, such as freezing the eggs. This option has been available for the last few years. Therefore, we can freeze the eggs and keep them in the freezer for you. Then when you are ready later on, you try with your partner. If it doesn't happen, you always have the backup of coming and using your eggs. Because if you freeze your eggs now, they are going to be only 36 years. And say you meet a right Mr. Right and try to plan, start having the family at the age of 40, your eggs will be at the age of, at that time, will be 40 years old. Whereas these frozen eggs are still young at 36. Therefore, the earlier you do, younger you are, better it is going to be. So that's why it's important to do fertility MOT. And these tests are all accurate. It's not going to tell you, give you false results. So these are reasonably accurate. That is why we use two methods to confirm that. One is the blood test to say, what is your egg reserve? Other one is the ultrasound scan to physically look into the ovaries to see how many antral follicles you have got. Thank you. And then we have another question, which is, I am a surrogate and I would like to know for how long sperm has to be quarantined. I heard that it can be anything between six weeks and six months. Well, so to answer the question, it's the sperm for, use in surrogacy treatment, it's treated as donor sperm. So donor sperm in the UK, the amount of time it has to be quarantined for depends upon how it's tested. So if it's tested using the old techniques of serology, then the quarantine period is 180 days or six months. If, however, the sperm is also tested using a more recent method called nucleic acid test testing, which is shortened to NAT, then the quarantine period can be reduced to three months. The next question we have is how do you source fertility drugs? Do you collect them at the clinic or do you collect them at your local pharmacy? And so the answer to your question is you can do either, whichever is your preference. 
we do stock them at the clinic and you can purchase them from us or we can give you a prescription and you can have it filled at your local pharmacy. You can also order them through some home care companies and they'll deliver them to you as well. So it's really whatever is convenient to you, but also it's worth noting that, you know, collecting them at your local pharmacy or via a home care company, the person who's giving you the medicine won't really know what's going on with them. Whereas the benefit of collecting them at the clinic is that the nurse who gives them to you or the pharmacist who gives them to you on site will be able to explain what the medicines are exactly with the physical boxes, explain how they work and how to self-administer them. What is the longest time donor sperm may be kept for prior to use? I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Ben Kapp. Okay. So usually, like Suvir mentioned previously, we had to quarantine the donor sperm for six months before it is released for use. But now with the new testing and especially if it is known donation and if it is surrogacy cases, it can be released after three months, provided the person has had the repeat test and we know that everything, all the tests are clear. And if you say you want to keep it longer, as long as donor has signed the consent for say up to a maximum of 10 years, then it can be kept up to 10 years because that is the maximum storage period allowed in the UK legally by the our authority, Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. That is what it is now. And so if somebody uses the donor sperm and want to have a sibling or have another baby later on after two, three years, as long as the donor has signed the consent to keep the sperm frozen for up to 10 years, and this one, the usage is within that period, you can keep use it within the 10, 10 years as long as he has signed it. If he has only signed for five years, you can use the donors. You have to use the donor sperm within five years unless you are able to contact the donor and ask him to request to sign for another five years. So that is the rule according to the use. The, I hope this is what you were asking. If you, if it is something different, please tell me I can explain it. I think all that that leaves for me to do is to thank all of you for attending. And I would like to thank our panel. So thank you, Dr. Becker. Thank you, Molly. And thank you, Karina. And last but not least, I would like to thank Remote Solutions. Gavin and Ashley, you've done an excellent job in hosting and moderating this for us. Thank you very much. It went really smoothly. And we hope that this webinar has been useful to all of you who are sort of looking at treatment and your options. And I would also just like to take this opportunity to let you know that we have another webinar next week at the same time, um, which discusses treatment more in detail and how we're doing things a bit differently in the clinic. So if that's something you're interested in, um, please do talk to Karina and she'll be able to send you the registration link for that. So thank you all very much and um, have a lovely evening and a very nice weekend. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.